Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the final day of NASA Earth Applied Sciences Week. Over the past week, we've celebrated the many ways NASA Earth Science helps make our world a better place. Thank you all so much to everyone who has joined us this week. My name is Sydney Neugebauer. I'm a fellow with the NASA Developed National Program at Langley Research Center, and I'm your MC for the day. To remind you of a few housekeeping items before we begin, everyone is automatically muted, so please connect with us in the breakout sessions after the plenary today at 2.15 p.m. Eastern Time. For the complete agenda for today's events and links to those breakout rooms, please visit the event webpage or check out the handout section in the GoToWebinar panel. We'll also post links to those breakout rooms here at the end of our presentations today. So now I'll hand it over to Lawrence Friedel, Director of NASA's Applied Sciences Program, for our final opening remarks. Thank you, Lawrence. Great. Thank you, Sydney. And uh, welcome, as she said, to the fourth and final day of the 2020 Applied Sciences Week. Um, we've heard from dozens of people and examples so far this week. Uh, welcome back to those of you who have tuned in uh, previously. Uh, and welcome also, if you're just joining us today, um, I got to tell you, you've missed a lot. But the good news is, a full 25% uh, is still today, so there's lots there's lots to hear. Uh, so we have 12 talks overall, including six from DEVELOP, uh, and we hear about work in Asia by SEVERE program, as well as uh, uses of Earth observations for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, this week is also a capstone event for the 65 people who have been involved in the summer term for DEVELOP, which is one of the programs within Applied Sciences uh, and as part of the capstone, I've been giving a challenge each day to the developed participants, or what we call the developers. Um, Tuesday was about communications and crafting narratives. Wednesday was about perspective, include especially engaging users to learn their perspectives and their concerns and, and even the language and lexicon that they have. Today is about attitude uh, and the importance of maintaining a positive attitude. Um, I, I think when I think about this, sort of the, a, a positive attitude essentially provides a constructive approach uh, and sort of a learning framework uh, as, you, as you go into new tasks. Uh, it also provides a, a type of resilience as you and all of us you know, will no doubt have struggles and setbacks. Uh, and so I think with a positive attitude, you can go in seeing things as opportunities. Um, a, a quick story. I remember back of my freshman week in, in college um, and I was having to go to take my swim test uh, and I was walking alongside an upperclassman uh, and I was being cynical about the swim test and uh, a and little sarcastic and I was trying to appear cool to this upperclassman uh, and he flat out looked at me and corrected me. He said, hey, you might meet your new best friend there. Uh, and it snapped me out of it and made me realize, wow, I really got to approach things as opportunities. And so I pass that on to you. But I also want to say that a positive attitude is more than just about you and internally. Uh, I think it needs to extend to others. Um, I, I, one, one time I, can, I ran across a phrase that talked about assume positive intent. Uh, and I really encourage you to think about it and really encourage you to sort of internalize it. Um, I think so often, uh, when someone at work or maybe a friend or a family member does something that you don't like, um, we make assumptions about their intent. Um, we make inferences um, and sometimes infer that people had really dubious intentions. Sometimes we get angry, but it's unwarranted. Uh, and so I'm challenging you to check yourself on that, to prevent that. Uh, and so this phrase, assume positive intent, means that someone probably had a, a reason uh, perhaps a good reason for why they did something. Uh, and so I think you first need to give them the benefit of the doubt and simply ask them in a respectful way why they did something. And I think that invites a constructive conversation uh, and really sort of builds trust. So I hope you've appreciated these challenges throughout the week. Um, and I hope the develop and, and all the people listening will reflect on this. Uh, so again, today's challenge, positive attitude and assume positive intent. Now, DEVELOP is just one part of this week and one part of the Applied Sciences program. Here to tell you more about Applied Sciences is Emily Seidler Glassman. For all intents and purposes, she's the Deputy Director uh, of the Applied Sciences program. So over to you, Emily. Thanks, Lawrence. And I really like those, those words. I, um, I definitely um, 
agree like keeping a positive attitude just makes everything better um okay welcome welcome to day four um next slide please i'm going to try to fly through these because i know some of you have um have heard this a couple times now so um the applied sciences program sits within nasa's earth science division which has this amazing mission to understand our planet better and then use that understanding to benefit people next slide please so um we have four elements within NASA's Earth Science Division, and Applied Sciences is one of them. Uh, we work with our uh, colleagues from the flight element, which includes data systems, and those are the folks that develop, launch, and operate the fleet of satellites, and then make sure all the data coming from those satellites down to the ground stations becomes freely, open, freely and openly available to anyone anywhere in the world, um, which is both amazing and takes a tremendous amount of work to, to get that all working. We also work with our colleagues in research and analysis, and those are the folks funding and conducting this fundamental Earth system science to understand how do all the processes all over the world uh, fit together to give us this understanding of how, how the Earth works. Um, we, and we additionally work with our colleagues from the technology office, which are the folks looking 15, 20 years in the future, trying to figure out what our problems are going to be and what technologies do we need to be developing and fielding and testing now so that we have the technologies we need when that happens. And all of these pieces fit together and we inspire one another with um, advances and we can bring uh, the challenges that one, one of us is having and that might spur research in another part. And, and that's how we drive this, uh, drive, drive this forward. Next slide, please. The Applied Science Program specifically provides support and funding to institutions and individuals to make better decisions. And I have the six elements here below, water resources, ecological for forecasting, food security and agriculture, capacity building, disasters and health and air quality. And the program managers for each of these lead these really incredible programs. And I think you'll see flavors of it throughout, throughout today, throughout this week, even if you didn't get to hear their uh, great plenaries on day one. Um, and I specifically want to thank the Capacity Building Program, which has uh, organized and, and held this event. Um, and, and special thanks and welcome to the developers. It's been wonderful hearing your presentations. The Capacity Building Program tries to improve the capabilities of individuals and institutions to access and apply this, the Earth observation knowledge that we have here in NASA. Next slide, please. So what, what do we do? We make investments in projects and people and teams, and we try to develop with those investments, innovative and practical uses of Earth observations. And we try to do this throughout the mission life cycle of our satellites. So from the very moment where we have decided that we're going to be building a new satellite or going to be building a new instrument to figure out what's going to be useful, what's gonna bring benefit to society? How do we make that instrument, that satellite as useful as possible to people? Then how do we get ready for, how do we help the uh, public get ready to use that satellite data? And how do we provide feedback to the vote, those involved in making decisions for that mission so the data is as useful and usable as possible? Um, next slide, please. I think that might be my final slide. So just thank you. Thank you to all the developers. Thank you to all of you that are here today. It's been wonderful hearing all the work that you're doing. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Emily and Lawrence, for those remarks. So we will now begin our thematic highlights. Today's presentations are organized by their geographic focus on the eastern United States and Asia. So we'll kick off our presentations today with Dr. R.G. Kavada, Manager of the Earth Sciences Division's Activities Related to Sustainable Development Goal. Welcome, RG. Thank you very much, Sydney. I hope everybody can hear me well. Uh, having some trouble with my webcam, so I'm not going to turn this on. My, my apologies. So, as uh, Sydney mentioned, I, um, I wanted uh, today, I want to talk to you a bit about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and some of the things that um, NASA is leading and participating in activities internationally and also within the US to, to support and, and enable the use of Earth observations um, to help countries uh, monitor and also drive progress toward sustainable development. So next slide, please. So first of all, about the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So five years ago, world leaders gathered from around the world to adopt this agenda. And so this marks a milestone in the evolution of society's efforts to define and manage progress towards sustainable development in all its facets. 
social inclusion, economic growth and environmental sustainability. And so there are 17 sustainable development goals and there are 169 associated targets and in addition, a global indicator framework that have been put together to help countries and the international community measure, manage, monitor progress and also communicate on this progress on achieving sustainable development. Data is at the center of this agenda as well. And so from the very start, it was recognized that a wide range of data sources are needed to support uh, implementation of this agenda, including within this data, earth observations and other types of geospatial information. Next slide. Um, here on the next slide, uh, I wanted to talk briefly about this uh, latest, the most recent Sustainable Development Goals Report 2020 that came out. Um, this is a report that is issued by the UN Secretary General every year. And so in this report, it was noted that before the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, progress remained uneven in terms of um, achieving the SDGs across regions in the world. And so some visible gains have been documented in areas that relate to decrease of children and young adults that are out of school or the decline of incidence of many communicable diseases, as well as increase in women's representation in leadership roles worldwide. But at the same time, the number of people suffering from food insecurity has been on the rise in addition to other <clears throat> types of uh, uneven progress in terms of uh, um, uh, natural environment deterioration, as well as persistent inequality across regions. And so with the global pandemic, uh, this unprecedented health, economic and social crisis uh, has, uh, re does represent a, a threat to the progress and, and efforts that countries have been making in achieving sustainable development. And also this uneven progress in different areas covered um, through this uh, global policy framework are also affecting the way in which uh, countries are dealing with and, and, and uh, also recovering from or planning to recover from this pandemic. And so the UN Secretary General has called for a coordinated and comprehensive international response and recovery effort that is based on science and sound data and uses the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, as an organizing framework. Next slide, please. Now, Earth observations do provide powerful tools for understanding past and current conditions of Earth as an integrated system and can therefore help countries advance their efforts to, to achieve sustainable development. And so to help advance global knowledge about effective ways in which Earth observations and geospatial information can support the SDGs, NASA, on behalf of the US, has led the creation and development of uh, a global international initiative through the Group on Earth Observations, the Earth Observations for Sustainable Development Goals Initiative. And so eo for sdg is a growing network of many partners. You can see some of them highlighted on the bottom left. Uh, and it is also being co-led by um, Mexico and Japan in addition to the US. And it aims to um, working with, uh, uh, at the national level, statistical offices, ministries, and relevant stakeholders, as well as at the regional and global levels with relevant institutions, UN agencies, and others, to demonstrate how Earth observations contribute in novel and practical ways to support the SDGs and also increase skills and capabilities in users of the data for SDG activities and their derived benefits, as well as in, in broadening awareness and understanding of, of um, the contributions of, of Earth observations. In addition to your 4 sdg NASA leads and participates in a number of other international activities and, and Group on Earth Observation flagships and initiatives that are designed to bring scientific observations to users who need them in, di in different types of sectors, such as biodiversity, forestry, agriculture, or urban. And we have heard about some of these activities throughout the week. One that comes to mind, NASA Harvest and the Global um, Agricultural Monitoring Initiative, GeoGlam. Next slide, please. 
So our initiative has a website and also an active Twitter account. So I would like to invite you all to join us on Twitter, follow us on Twitter. If you are on Twitter, we also have a Facebook page with the same handle. And in addition, the website does have more information on relevant projects and activities. So please do uh, take a moment and, and visit that as well. Next slide, please. So as part of the, the efforts that we have been complete, we have been looking at how Earth observations contribute to the goals and their associated targets and indicators, both in terms of the types of information and data that can be the types of information that can be derived from Earth observations, including biodiversity related or ecosystem related uh, information but also by looking at how the data can help um, serve as direct input uh, to indicators or support and augment statistical data and other types of more traditional data sources in addition to improving the production process of surveys and statistical information and helping communicate and visualize patterns and, and changes from from a baseline again to support countries in monitoring and understanding how they're moving toward achieving these uh, targets and goals in addition we have recognized that despite the many opportunities offered by earth observation data and, and relevant processing tools uh, that can help address SDG data challenges. There are also limitations to the data and also the human and technical capacity to process them. And so you can see some of those challenges that are commonly stated. And so um, we are working, so NASA through its international uh, partners is working to help make advancements and improvements in many of those challenges. Uh, next slide, please. And so it's, it is doing that through many different activities, including projects uh, from feasibility studies to more uh, full-fledged um, long-term projects, capacity development and co-design efforts, as well as different types of outreach and engagement. And so I wanted to highlight one of the projects that NASA is funding, NASA Applied Sciences Program is funding, which builds on NASA's earlier work in Central America under the SERVIR program, and also serves as a demonstration project for the eu for sdg initiative. So this project uh, explore, uh, explores how Earth observation data, including moderate resolution NASA optical data sets, in addition to in-situ measurements of coral reef extent, uh, water quality, as well as nutrient load, can be used to help Belizean uh, agencies, government agencies, um, with uh, meeting their sustainable development goal commitments, in particular on goal 14, um, to help uh, uh, sustainably use and um, maintain the marine resources for sustainable development, and also goal 15, on promoting sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems. And so uh, this team is uh, working and has already um, visited Belize, uh, um, working with local institutions and in-country partners, uh, such as the Belize Coastal Zone Management Authority and Institute to understand what, how, how, what are the needs of the Belizean people and how this can be met through this activity. In addition, they have been performing a variety of in situ data collection activities to help uh, um, uh, both um, calibrate satellite imagery, but also examine indicators like total suspended solids to assess the amount of sediment and other particles floating in the water. And so these data are um, used or will be used to help develop a, a number of marine remote sensing tools to allow um, um, Belizean agencies to examine past and present trends and also forecast water quality trends using hydrological models. Uh, so this is just one example of a project of a team that is working within country partners, leveraging past activities that um, um, NASA has developed in the region in addition to ongoing collaborations with regional institutions like SICA that we have heard about from Betsy Hernandez and others this week to support and, and help enable the use of the data um, uh, for, um, in particular for these uh, um, two relevant um, sustainable development goals. Next slide, please. 
Another activity that I wanted to briefly highlight through your 4SDG, we have been working to, um, to help identify and recognize um, examples of excellence and innovation in users of Earth observation data for particular um, SDGs across across the world. And so you can see that this program, the GeoSDG Awards program, was launched last year. And um, you can see there the list of awardees from last year, one of them being Uganda for their work on applying Earth observation data to help predict a drought, which ended up saving the government about 2.6 million US dollars that could then be used in relief after the drought. And so this award received national and local media attention and has helped um, develop even more support for the use of, of um, Earth observation data and technologies um, in not only food security related, but also other sectors. And so we are in the process of um, running through our next round of awards this year. The last slide that I have, if we can go to the next slide, please, is to also show you that we've also been doing um, uh, quite a bit in documenting and sharing um, knowledge from the Earth observation community on how Earth observation scientists are working with countries and relevant stakeholders to integrate Earth observations in SDG indicator methodologies, but also through both advancing the science that can support the development of metrics, but also through applied projects that help get the data integrated in country processes. And so this specific special issue highlights um, uh, such uh, efforts and um, progress through 17 publications and an editorial. One main message that we've derived by uh, completing this issue has been that there is still a need <clears throat> to do more to close the gap between acquired data and then how this can be used to really help um, countries and, and relevant stakeholders make advancements in policy targets and goals. And so <clears throat> you can see on the graph on the right that there is this need for um, focusing and advancing more the activities that focus on transitioning from a data and information to more of the knowledge production and experiences that come from this uh, applied knowledge through the use of Earth observations. Next slide, please. And so with that, I wanted to thank you all very much. I'm very happy to, to be here and to have shared this with you. Please uh, follow us on Twitter and send me an email if you have questions. Sydney, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, RG. So up next, we're going to highlight health and air quality applications with a presentation from Dr. Tabasim Insaf from the New York State Department of Health. Thanks for joining us. Trying to unmute myself. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, right. we can. Perfect. <laughs> Um, good afternoon. Uh, as has been said, my name is Tabe Simonsov. I am from the New York State Department of Health. And uh, today I'll talk about how we've used NASA's Earth observation data to provide evidence for climate and health policy at the state and local level. Next slide, please. Um, so this research and the public health actions informed by the research were made possible by grant funding from NASA. Uh, this was a NASA Roses grant that we were awarded in 2015, but we've also leveraged uh, our other CDC grants, the, mainly the Environmental Public Health Tracking Program and the Climate Ready Cities and State Initiatives to develop outreach and education around these efforts. Um, we also partnered with Florida Department of Health and New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for these projects, but today I'm going to be highlighting the work that we've done specifically in the state of New York. Um, we have had great partners like, uh, previous slide please, sorry. Um, we've had great partners uh, like the University Space Research Association, the University of Alabama in Huntsville, and Florida State Universities. Uh, those were our academic partners. And we have had a wonderful group of stakeholders and end users that have uh, made sure that our research is relevant to climate and health policy in the state um, of New York and Florida. Next slide, please. All right. Uh, so the reason we looked into satellite data um, for our program was because 
previously in our research, we were limited to the monitoring stations in New York. Um, so the first map on the left uh, top is the monitoring station in New York and the gray boundaries are the county boundaries. And you can see that there are um, some counties that are actually you do not even have uh, one monitoring station in that county. So we had sparse data, especially in the rural areas um, and you know the urban areas, we had um, enough monitors, uh, but there were very few monitors that could give us um, a long climate trend uh, so that were functioning for uh, a, a long enough time. Um, the second map uh, on the top, panel uh, on the right is our spatial interpolation that we did uh, based on the monitor data. And you can see that we were looking at climate trends and you can see that there are regional variations in climate trends, but the spatial interpolation was crude because of the lack of monitoring in C2 data. Uh, so then the NASA ROSES grant allowed us to use the 12 kilometer uh, North American land data simulation system. That is the data set that we've used. Uh, that is the map on the right uh, in the bottom panel. Um, and that it provides us a, uh, it's available uh, for the contiguous US and it allows us a uniform spatial surface to conduct research in rural and urban areas. We further downscale this using the MODIS uh, land surface temperature data set uh, to a one kilometer grid, which actually allows us to, to look at local effects like the urban heat, heat island effect and the coastal gradients in New York. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in New York, as in other places in the US, the National Weather Service is the primary agency that forecasts weather um, and issues warnings and advisories based on the maximum heat index forecast uh, over the next 24 to 72 hours. So we reached out to them uh, to understand how warnings were issued. Um, and we found that the previous temperature thresholds for heat advisories and warnings in upstate New York uh, were established over 20 years ago, and they were not based on any heat health association or any local data at all. Um, so now that we had uh, the NLDAS reanalysis data uh, through the NASA ROSES uh, opportunity, there was this opportunity to conduct heat health analysis for all regions of New York. And we wanted to reassess this criteria uh, for heat advisory. So at that uh, point in time, the heat advisories were issued at 100 degree Fahrenheit uh, for the area. And if you live in New York, you would know um, that in a temperate climate like New York, there are very few days, if any, um, during summers that actually reach up to 100 or 105 degree Fahrenheit. Next slide, please. So why should we care about extreme heat in a temperate region like New York? And and I get this a lot uh, uh, in terms of, you know, why focus on heat in such a cold area? And as you can see in the map on the right, summer temperatures across New York have been increasing. Um, these are temperature anomalies calculated as a difference from the 30 year average or 30 year norm for that area. So although we don't have extreme temperatures or you know, um, heat waves, uh, we do uh, see that there is the average temperatures of these areas uh, show a warming trend and annual average temperatures have actually been increasing by over two degree Fahrenheit in 1970 with a prominent increase in the last decade. Uh, we took these data and started correlating these temperatures with data on thousands of emergency department visits and hospital admissions of heat related illness, uh, such as heat stress, dehydration, renal illness, um, cardiovascular illness. And we found that a five degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature in that daily maximum summer temperature could actually double the risk of heat related illness in New Yorkers. The risk of heat was sustained four to five days after exposure, and both urban and rural areas were at risk. So previously, you know, the urban areas were where all our warnings were focused on, but we found that rural areas were also at risk, and the threshold temperatures for risk actually appeared to be lower in the rural areas. Young adults are at as high risk as uh, for health effects of heat. Uh, probably due to uh, you know, recreational and um, occupational exposures. So that was another uh, area that you know, we, we started focusing on. Next slide, please. So then we decided to look into these thresholds for risk of illness. And these charts show the risk of illness at different thresholds, different values of the maximum heat index. Uh, the excess risk temperature is that red dot 
on these charts. And this shows where we start seeing statistically significant risk of illness. Uh, so above any temperature above that red dot, so that uh, is, is a significant risk of illness. And uh, for heat stress, this was de defined as 84 degree Fahrenheit, um, and it was actually even lower for uh, the outcomes like dehydration, kidney failure, and cardiovascular disease. And if you look at that blue line, that is the 100 degree Fahrenheit mark, which was the uh, the advisory, uh, the previous advisory. Um, and you can see that there is uh, actually a pretty significant risk of illness at temperature is lower than the heat advisory. So then when we we went back to the National Weather Service with this evidence um, and, uh, you know, we were, uh, we worked with them uh, and they chose to revisit the heat advisory criteria for the region. Next slide, please. So this chart shows you the revised regional heat advisory criteria, uh, how that looks like now. So we recommended, and the National Weather Service offices in New York and the surrounding Vermont region uh, actually changed all their heat advisory criteria, effective June 1st, 2018. Um, and so we've, we, the advisories are now issued at 95 degree Fahrenheit for more for uh, or more for two consecutive hours. And this was also conveyed in Governor Cuomo's um, press release, um, and NASA did a web feature on this, and we've you know. Uh, done a whole outreach campaign um, around uh, uh, risk of heat illness in New York State. Uh, we believe that this change would capture a high proportion of heat events likely to result in significant morbidity. But uh, you know, we, we know that the risk actually starts at much lower temperature, but we wanted to avoid a warning fatigue if frequent advices were issued at lower temperature. Next slide, please. So in addition to the weather advisory change, we have used these earth observation data to provide our local health departments with detailed climate profiles for the region. For example, you can see this is a county heat and health profile report that's available on our website. So each county has this report and um, you can see in this chart, the the chart in the middle uh, shows the base, uh, shows the uh, uh, temperature anomalies uh, for this county. Um, so the baseline there is the average temperature in the last 30 years. And the blue lines are when the temperatures were lower than the average for that year. Um, and the red lines show uh, any temperatures that were higher than the 30 year average for that county. And you can see that in the recent years, especially uh, after 2011, um, there is a one to two degree uh, increase in temperature, increase in average temperatures. And 2016 for Cortland County was even four degrees higher than the norm. Um, and we see this trend across all our counties. Um, we also provide uh, the chart on the right. Bottom is uh, the heat related illness for that county and the chart on the bottom uh, upper corner, uh, sorry, the chart on the top corner uh, is our uh, projections for that county. So we are, we also provide each county the projections based on different energy scenarios uh, about how the, uh, the temperature would look like in the next hundred or so years uh, based on the climate policies. So the, we hope that these will be able, uh, the local health departments will be able to use these uh, profiles to inform their policies um, as they move forward. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, we've updated our environmental public health tracking portal. So this is a portal where we provide data in a very uh, usable, user-friendly and uh, simple format with simple messaging for the public. Um, and here you can see that we actually have started providing really detailed sub-county maps and uh, temperature trends uh, for all areas across state. So people can go in, look at their area, and look at how uh, climate is changing across, the state, across their area. Um, and uh, then correlate it with other climate information that is on our webpage. Um, and so this is all uh, also available publicly for download. And uh, we aim to also provide our uh, 12 kilometer and one kilometer data sets to researchers on um, demand. So we can we can provide that uh, for anybody else who would like to you know, replicate these analyses. 
So as a concluding thought, uh, the time and resources that we've invested in learning about the Earth observation state data has been very rewarding from a, program, a programmatic perspective. And although we haven't featured it in this presentation, we also use Earth observation data to assess health effects of air pollution and also are looking into using satellite imagery data for harmful algal bloom surveillance. Thank you again for the time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions over email. Uh, thanks again for the NASA Applied Sciences Program and our team, including all our partners and stakeholders. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And now we're going to hear about some related work from Sophie Barrowman, a participant with the DEVELOP program at our Boston location. Welcome, Sophie. Thank you, Sydney. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sophie Barrowman, and I am representing the Cambridge Urban Development Team from the Massachusetts Boston NASA DEVELOP location. I'll be telling you a little bit about our team's work on quantifying changes in urban albedo to reduce the urban heat island effect in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Next slide, please. While Cambridge is historically considered to have a cold weather climate, as a populous urban area, it is susceptible to rising global temperatures. Cities with dense buildings, dark impervious surface, and a lack of vegetation experience a phenomenon called the urban heat island effect, where urban environments are several degrees warmer than surrounding rural and suburban areas. Approximately 60% of Cambridge is impervious surface, which contributes to increasing urban heat. By 2030, Cambridge is expected to experience overall warmer temperatures and as many as triple the number of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit per year. Elevated temperatures are associated with increases in heat-related mortalities, energy consumption, air pollution, and impacts to local biodiversity. These impacts may be exacerbated by climate change and heat waves. Albedo is a unitless measurement of reflectance defined as the proportion of solar radiation that is reflected by a surface. If you could please click next, the next figure, thank you. Uh, albedo is important to the study of urban heat islands because low albedo surfaces like dark asphalt absorb light and emit more heat, while high albedo surfaces reflect most light and therefore heat away from the city. Mitigation efforts to increase albedo in cities often include painting rooftops white. Next slide, please. To address these community concerns, we partnered with planners at the City of Cambridge Community Development Department, as well as the American Geophysical Union's Thriving Earth Exchange. Cambridge is currently working on a climate change preparedness and resilience plan, which includes efforts to reduce the urban heat island effect, but does not currently consider albedo. Our goals for the project were to calculate changes in rooftop albedo over time, map nighttime temperature hotspots in Cambridge and Eastern Massachusetts, and finally create an interactive ArcGIS dashboard to allow end users and community stakeholders to interact with our results. We accomplished these objectives using high resolution ortho imagery to study rooftop albedo and the NASA Earth Observation Aquamodus to study nighttime land surface temperature. We use data collected at night because this offers a better contrast between rural and urban areas to show the urban heat island effect. Next slide, please. The figure on the left visualizes the results of the albedo calculations applied to the 2018 high resolution ortho imagery. The dark red buildings represent rooftops with the lowest range in albedo, less than 0.3, and the white buildings represent rooftops with the highest albedo values greater than 0.8. We applied this calculation to a time series of ortho images to assess albedo change, and we found that between the years 2008 and 2018, rooftop albedo increased, meaning became lighter, by approximately 0.12 across the city. The majority of positive change in albedo was found in non-residential areas. On the right, we enlarged the MIT neighborhood to provide a more detailed view of the results, Using a simple visual comparison, it is evident that the calculated rooftop albedo matches up with the visual brightness of the respective rooftops in the true color imagery. Next slide, please. Next, we created a record of nighttime land surface temperature and calculated the temperature difference from the mean to map hotspots and cold spots. The figure on the left shows the summer 2019 temperature anomalies for a section of Eastern Massachusetts. The mean nighttime temperature for the region was 60.2 degrees Fahrenheit, 
The areas shown in yellow represent hot spots where the average temperature was up to 6.36 degrees warmer than the mean. This hot spot is especially visible in the greater Boston area, including Cambridge. We found that Cambridge had a positive mean temperature difference of 2.89 degrees Fahrenheit between 2004 and 2019, which is evidence of increasing urban heat in the area due to the urban heat island effect. Finally, the results from both rooftop albedo and the temperature anomaly calculations were input into an ArcGIS dashboard, which will allow our partners and the public to interact with our findings and explore how albedo and temperature change in relation to other relevant factors, such as tree canopy and impervious surface. These methods and results will provide our partners at the City of Cambridge with insight into the progress of their climate change preparedness and resilience plan and inform future initiatives to increase albedo of rooftops and make Cambridge more resilient to the effects of urban heat. Thank you everyone for your attention and for this opportunity to share our work. Thank you so much, Sophie. Great job with your presentation. I'm now going to hand it over to Jason Puti, another developed participant at our Athens, Georgia location to share his team's work this term. Thank you, Sydney. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending this presentation. Uh, my name is Jason, and today I'll be presenting the results from the third term of the Georgia Energy Project at the Georgia Athens node of NASA Develop. During the course of the term, our goal was to identify and map environmental sensitivity and solar suitability in the state of Georgia. Next slide, please. Over the past decade, the solar energy market in Georgia has developed rapidly. The state was ranked the fifth fastest growing solar market in the US in 2019. This growth has compromised the habitats of the American black bear and the gopher tortoise, a keystone species and candidate for federal protection. With support from our partners at the Georgia Department of Natural Resources and the Nature Conservancy, our team developed a web mapping application called the Environmental Sensitivity Mapping Tool, or the ESMT. The ESMT serves as an interactive repository and houses the input map layers and all the output maps. Its primary function is to be a decision support tool where the solar developers can input data on their current and upcoming projects to influence their decisions on the siting of solar energy infrastructure. The ESMT on its own does not provide analytical capabilities, but outputs from each of the study years can be compared using built-in ESRI widgets. Next slide, please. In order to create the tool and to inform decision-making, Earth observation-based data was used to create a land use conflict identification strategy or LUCIS model that weighted several parameters based on their significance for environmental sensitivity and solar suitability. The model uses the RASA calculator to combine the results from the weighted overlay and create a new two-digit conflict value. The solar suitability score concatenated with the environmental sensitivity score results in a bivariate conflict value that represents the different colors of the LUCIS output. Conflict values that have the same value in both places, like 33, 22, and 11, indicate high levels of conflict, whereas numbers like 31 indicate high solar suitability and low sensitivity, making it the most ideal location for development. Next slide, please. While the bivariate color ramp is detailed, it may not be easy to draw visual conclusions from the figure. To make the results of the LUCIS model more comprehensible, we reclassified the bivariate conflict values into levels of preference for solar development as shown on the right. Green areas in the figure represent the regions that have high preference for solar development, and red areas represent the regions of low preference. The gray regions represent the protected lands, restricted lands, and land trusts that are managed by the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. Something to note is that areas of high environmental sensitivity were reclassified as low preference despite their solar suitability. This was done in order to prioritize the conservation of environmentally sensitive regions. Next slide, please. Our interpretation of quantitative analysis on our results revealed the following conclusions. Overall, the state became more suitable and preferable for utility scale solar development and there was an increase in the overall preference for development by 1.5% between 2017 and 2019. The area under the restricted regions remained constant between both the years. There's an approximate decrease of 17% in area under the regions of low preference, while there's an approximate increase of 3% in area under the regions of high preference. 
the regions of moderate preference saw a negligible increase of 0.07%. Our partners intend to share the results of the study along with the ESMT with solar developers, conservationists, and other community stakeholders in order for them to make an informed decision on solar infrastructure siting. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, feel free to join our breakout session this afternoon or reach out to us separately. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Back to you, Sydney. Thank you so much, Jason. I'm now pleased to introduce Dr. Charles Hoyk, Executive Vice President of ImageCat to share a disasters highlight with us today. Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, my name is Charles Hike. Um, I'm going to be presenting Open Critical Infrastructure Exposure for Disaster Forecasting Mitigation and Response. Uh, we're working on this grant, several of us at ImageCat, uh, but we've got project partners, uh, Hot OSM, and uh, Bob Chen and Greg Yetman at CSIN are also working with us. So uh, what's the problem here? What are we, what are we working on? Um, the problem is that um, when critical infrastructure is damaged, it, uh, it often causes disasters to cascade into catastrophes. Uh, you can think of this in terms of uh, what you know about Katrina. It wasn't the direct um, surge or wind on the buildings that caused most of the damage. It was the, the breach of the levee that, uh, that flooded the city and, uh, and, and so, um, ended in a lot of economic disruption and migration. Uh, Tohoku earthquake is another good example where the nuclear power plant um, meltdown uh, was arguably more damaging and disruptive economically than um, than the actual uh, tsunami wave or the ground motion. So our hope is to develop something along the lines of LandScan, uh, an industrial and critical infrastructure database that could be used to identify where these sort of um, accidents are, are waiting to occur. Next slide, please. Okay, so the context that we're working with, uh, we're working within here is uh, that of loss estimation or CAT modeling, as it's called in the insurance industry. This is where you take a flood, um, hurricane, tornado, uh, earthquake, and project what the likely losses and effects are going to be. So we do that before events to, to as training scenarios to figure out, you know, if a Cat 5 uh, hits Miami, uh, what's likely to be the effects, where should you stage resources, uh, how should you uh, prepare for that uh, during an event, actually as it sort of unfolds, as the hurricane approaches, for example, whether you need to um, uh, proactively stage resources or, um, or evacuate, or uh, in the terms of earthquake, shut down critical infrastructure post-event where you need to send out resources. Uh, and then average, um, on average, if you have a whole library of events in a catalog, you can run through them iteratively um, and figure out you know, where, where building codes are justified, uh, where you should be mitigating critical infrastructure uh, and uh, what you should charge for, for insurance premiums. Next slide. But what happens is often very different than what we predict uh, now, and largely it's because of these sort of critical infrastructure failures. And my favorite example here is uh, the floods in Thailand of 2011. A uh, few hundred buildings there on the river in Bangkok got flooded. Uh, should have been very easy to spot given, um, you know, Southeast Asia, lots of, uh, lots of flooding right there in the river and so forth. But it wasn't clear what was uh, going on in those, those facilities. It wasn't well known by the global industry. It's not tracked by supply chain databases. And so it really caught people off guard when these uh, facilities flooded. You had cascading failures in um, uh, automobile industry and flash drives that were created there. And in the end, Next year, the uh, GDP of Thailand shrank by um, almost 11%, which is, you know, real money, real jobs, um, people feeding families, and so forth. We often don't think of this uh, as catastrophic as uh, building damage, but in fact, it does uh, impact people's lives greatly, particularly uh, in developing economies. And so this has, uh, by the way, become a very um, big uh, focus of um, the SDGs and the Sendai framework to try to, to um, uh, characterize this type of, of, of disruption. So next slide, please. 
So often when uh, we talk about this, people say, well, you know, you've got critical infrastructure data uh, in GIS data sets. Why don't you just use that? Um, but in fact, it's very difficult to get all this together um, and practically impossible, um, I would say. And even if you did so, you'd have uh, quite a few problems. Uh, first of all, um, there's legitimate security concerns uh, in releasing critical infrastructure data, as I'm sure you can all imagine. Uh, a lot of it's privately held. Um, you've got uh, reporting bias. Um, many utilities and uh, entities are better at reporting than others, so you just come up with the answer that that's where your your problems were, where in fact there might be much bigger problems. So um, EO data offers an, an alternative that's sort of uh, all-seeing um, uh, and objective uh, in that regard, but um, you know obviously you can't uh, see into buildings, seeing what's going on in there. It lacks certain, it lacks the attributes, you can't see things like pipelines, um, and it lacks conductivity. But our, our hope is that we would be able to use this uh, to prioritize more detailed risk assessments um, that would be done um, in areas like um, Bangkok, Thailand, once you've uh, identified potential problems. Next slide. So this is an example, uh, one more. This is an example from uh, Gujarat, in our pilot state in India. Uh, it's a false color image with population, um, uh, urban uh, cover, and um, veers uh, mapped. And you can see, once you play with it a little bit, you have the critical infrastructure sort of popping out uh, on the port areas, uh, one and two labeled here, as well as several uh, sort of industrial corridors uh, mapped from city to city. And as you uh, uh, zero in on some of the um, the more substantial facilities, you can start to just really see uh, uh, where the power plants are and start to get, uh, classify these and so forth. So this is uh, a way that you can use to basically infill things like the, the OSM database where these are missing uh, and then start to um, make the assumptions that are required to do some of that um, global modeling. Next slide. And here's an example of sort of what we're shooting for to be able to characterize the, um, the cascading effects. Uh, on the y-axis here, we have uh, industrial intensity. That's for those little areas that we've identified as being critical infrastructure. Uh, the VIRS value summed up within those areas as a proxy for the economic activity um, that are associated with those, those locations. And then you overlay those with uh, any of your global hazard data sets in this um, this instance, we've chosen 100-year floods provided by one of our partners. Uh, and you can see our, our pilot state of Gujarat is very high in terms of the industrial intensity. And about 30% of that intensity is within 100-year uh, flood zones, for example. And you can use that to, to drill down to the county level and figure out where you could uh, indeed have problems. So moving on from this, we would hope to have not just the sort of idea of in industrial intensity, but uh, overlay that with some um, uh, notions of uh, fragility. Uh, as well as the potential cascading effects from an economic perspective, so that you can be able to um, to identify where you've got that sort of cascading potential. Next slide. And this is an example from the uh, latest typhoon to go up um, through uh, the Bay of Bengal, I think it is. Um, and we've just um, um, partnered with our friends at Kinetic Analysis Corporation to get their estimate of uh, the surge intensity and then overlaid that with our extracted infrastructure and we're able to drill down and, and find areas that uh, indeed might be of um, uh, danger of, uh, of surge damage and we're able to uh, provide that to the Indian government. This is on the opposite side of India as our, our pilot state, but you know, with EO data, we're able to do all of India and have this sort of in our back pocket um, and we're able to provide that, provide that to them. Another uh, thing that we're working on doing um, is partnering with another A37 grant um, disaster aware, Megan Glasgow's group, to be able to provide this, uh, this information within their flood modeling um, um, model of models approach. Uh, to set up alerts, uh, this is something that's of particular interest to our, our pilot city in Gujarat of, of Vadodara. Okay, uh, next slide. And that's all I have. I'll be a around for the uh, discussion session if you have any questions on our material. Sydney. Great, thank you so much. Alrighty, we're going to continue to explore disasters now with a presentation from Erica Munchi, a developed participant at Goddard Space Flight Center, and she's going to share her team's work this summer.
Thanks, Erica. Thanks, Sydney. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Erica Munchie, and I had the pleasure of serving as the team lead for the third term of the Ellicott City Disasters Develop Project. So during this term, we built on the work of two previous developed teams to create a real-time flood prediction tool for early warning systems in Ellicott City, Maryland. As you can see in the two photos below, Ellicott City is vulnerable to severe flood events. The pictures shown here illustrate one particular flood event in May of 2018 when over 20 cars were washed into the Patapsco River over the course of just two hours. The intensity of these floods illustrates a need for an enhanced early warning system, which is the primary motivation behind our project. Today, we are excited to share the progress we've made in creating a real-time flood, flood model predicting tool to address these concerns and support proactive decision-making in the future. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, Ellicott City is particularly vulnerable to flooding has, and has experienced over 10 extreme flooding events within the last 100 years, with two particularly devastating flood events since 2016. As you can see in these time lapses, the intensity of these floods is severe enough to move cars, destroy buildings, and wash out roadways. It's especially important to recognize that the damage incurred by these flood events leaves a lasting impact that harms businesses, residents, and public infrastructure. In order to protect the city, the Office of Emergency Management has developed an early warning system to alert residents of flood events before they occur. Our goal is to help improve this early warning system through implementing a real-time flood forecasting tool. Next slide, please. Our methodology has three primary stages, data acquisition, model development, and real-time model output. We use a variety of both in-situ stream gauge data as well as NASA and NOAA Earth observations to train and test our machine learning model. We also use real-time weather forecasts to allow our model to predict further out into the future. To develop the model, we use a deep learning architecture based on something called the long short-term memory cell. This type of architecture uses real-time weather data, as well as the past 16 hours of recorded stage height or river height to predict future stage height. Using this type of model allows us to create real-time stage height predictions for up to eight hours in advance of the current time point. We then conducted a sensitivity and error analysis to provide a measure of confidence for our stage height predictions. Our final model, titled STREAM, or Sequentially Trained Real-Time Estimated Model, was then integrated into an online platform called OneRain. To provide real-time outputs, we wrote scripts to iteratively run our model and output real-time stage height forecasts for the Hudson Branch in Ellicott City. Next slide, please. In order to evaluate our model performance, we wanted to see how well our model could predict a real flood event. Since we couldn't simulate a flood event in real time, we chose to forecast a flood event that had already occurred. To do so, we compared our model's prediction of the 2018 flood event to the observed stage height values from the actual event. In this hydrograph, you can see an example of our model's prediction in blue and the actual observed stage height values in black. As you can see, the model was able to accurately predict both the magnitude and the timeline of the flood event. The graph also shows the warning and alarm thresholds developed by the Office for Emergency Management in orange and red, respectively. When the hydrograph values pass the thresholds, it signals that the warning and alarm system should be initiated. Lastly, we use a nash sutcliffe efficiency metric, or NSC, to assess the accuracy of our model. The NSC score was 0.89, which suggests that our model has high predictive power. Next slide, please. We then integrated our tested model into an online platform called OneRain and created a customized dashboard with relevant information. On the right, you see a sample display of what the output looks like on the portal. This image shows a snapshot of a simulated forecast from the 2018 flood event. As you can see here, the model is able to iteratively show forecasts up to eight hours in advance, all displayed in a user-friendly and interactive format. While this image shows a simulated flood event, our real-time model displays new outputs hourly, allowing viewers to anticipate flood events well before they occur. In the sidebar, the dashboard also shows regional radar, recent precipitation, and the Howard County Office of Emergency Management's Twitter feed. Below the graph, the dashboard contains real-time images from a network of cameras depicting the current stage height at the Hudson and Patapsco River stream gauges. Together, the elements of the dashboard can support a comprehensive early warning system. We hope this tool will help our partners in Howard County engage in proactive decision-making to help make Ellicott City more resilient to flood events in the future. This project feels particularly relevant this week as Ellicott City experienced heavy rainfall from Hurricane Isaias on Monday and Tuesday. Throughout the storm, we were closely watching our one rain output to monitor our stage height predictions. Thankfully, the storm did not result in an extreme flooding event, but it was really exciting to see our tool operate in real time in response to the hurricane forecasts. 
Next slide, please. I'd just like to take a second to thank our science advisors at Goddard, our partners at the NOAA and National Weather Service Weather Forecasting Office, as well as our partners from Howard County for their guidance throughout this project. We'd also like to thank the residents of Ellicott City who were gracious enough to share their stories, photos, and videos with us. We hope our tool, which is active on our portal now, can be used to support greater flood resilience in Ellicott City in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. Thank you for sharing that very timely work. All right, now we're going to move into our ecological forecasting highlight with a presentation from Dr. Joaquin Goes, a research professor at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and first, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Woody Turner, Dr. Friedel, and Dr. Paula Bontempi, who I know is living today and is speaking right now at this moment. <clears throat> So I'll take you on a journey from Ellicott City, the talk that we heard before, to a distant place on our planet called the Arabian Sea, which is probably ex experiencing one of the fastest and most dramatic changes on our planet. And today's talk is about the work that we are doing with the government in that region from the Sultanate of Oman. And we are helping them try to manage uh, their coastal resources in this rapidly changing ecosystem. Can I have the next slide, please? So just to give you some perspective, um, you know, when I talk about this project, many people ask me, why is NASA spending so much of money in a distant place on our planet, which is unrelated to the United States? And you have got to realize that this area occupies a small footprint of our planet, but it's around this area we have one of the densest populations on our planet, about a third of our uh, Earth's uh, population lives in this region. And this area um, supplies most of the oil resources to uh, many of the countries around the world. So it is, in terms of our energy security, it's a very, very important place. And this area is under the influence of the monsoons. So any changes in the monsoons affects this area and the cultural economies of many of the countries around this area. So it's a threat to food security. And if this area becomes really unstable, it, it, it is a threat to our national security. Can I have the next slide, please? So just to give you some perspective, the Arabian Sea is a monsoonally driven uh, ecosystem and its productivity is controlled by this reversing monsoons that happen twice a year and during the summer the winds are from the southwest and as these winds blow across the coastal waters of um, of Somalia, Oman and Yemen <clears throat> they create what is known as coastal upwelling and you see these huge blooms of phytoplankton in winter, you have the reversal of the winds. Uh, the Indian subcontinent becomes very cold because of the snow that builds up in the Himalayan mountains. And you have this cold, dry winds blowing from the continent over the Arabian Sea, which co uh, cause a phenomenon called winter convective mixing, which brings up nutrients and again fuels huge blooms of phytoplankton. So this area is very, very productive in terms of uh, fisheries and so, and the fishery itself sustains about 150 million people uh, directly or indirectly. Next slide, please. So in 2005, uh, one of the things that we saw uh, is that the Arabian Sea was becoming very, very productive. Uh, can I? Yeah. So, um, and we found out that this change that was happening from 1997 to about 2005, was due to the melting of snow in the Himalayan mountains. And we showed that this melting of snow actually was causing the winds to intensify, coastal upwelling to intensify, and this was giving rise to huge blooms. And so at the bottom, you see uh, how much change occurred from 1997 to about 2005. So this area became really a very, very productive over a short period of time. So one of the questions that I'm always asked is, so if phytoplankton increased, you would get more productivity and more fisheries. But unfortunately, the Arabian Sea is landlocked to the north and so, and the circulation is very sluggish, especially at the bottom. So all this organic matter that is building up actually contributes to lo the loss of oxygen at depth. And the Arabian Sea, like the Gulf of Mexico, has got a permanent oxygen minimum zone. In the next slide, as you will see, uh, this oxygen minimum zone 
um, extends from about 150 meters to about 1,000 meters. So we have had this loss of snow that has been taking place in the Himalayan Tibetan mountains. And the, uh, winter, uh, the summer monsoon winds have intensified and you have a lot of organic matter being produced. And so that is sucking out the oxygen from the system. And so this oxygen minimum zone is expanding. Uh, conversely, in the winter, when you have had uh, less snow in the Himalayan Tibetan mountains, you have the winds that are coming out from the mountains that are warmer and more humid than they used to be. And one would expect that this process of winter convective mixing could be weaker. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? And so you would have less phytoplankton. But since 2000 year uh, onwards, we have been seeing that the Arabian Sea is becoming more and more productive also during winter. And this is the plot from the time of the sea coastal zone color scanner um, measurements in the 1980s to the present uh, by Modis Aqua. And you can see that the Arabian Sea has become three times more productive than it was about uh, 30 years ago, 30 or 40 years ago. So can I have the next slide? So um, in 2009, we were funded by NASA, um, the Ocean Biology and uh, Biodiversity Programs to study what was happening in the Arabian Sea. And what we saw was uh, very uh, dramatic and uh, astounding to us. Uh, the diatom blooms, the ones that uh, fuel the fisheries over there were being replaced by this organism called Noctiluca. And um, this organism, we found out, thrives in low oxygen waters, and it's a mixotroph. So the organism has got, it has endosymbionts, um, and this endosymbionts thrive in low oxygen waters. Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, from 1960 onwards to 2004, uh, 2020, we see that this Noctiluca has increased dramatically. And what we see here is this uh, change that has happened from diatoms to this mixotrophs. So in, during the Jacobs, the Joint Global Ocean Flux studies in the 1990s, they saw only diatoms. Today, we are seeing mixotrophs and mostly dominated by Noctiluca, which are giving rise to jellyfish and squid and replacing the traditional fisheries in this region. Can I have the next slide, please? And this will give you an example of how much change has occurred. Uh, this is from uh, October and November of 2019, where you can see this massive uh, jellyfish swarms uh, in the Sea of Oman and off the Arabian Sea coast of Oman. And here it has affected fisheries on the right hand side. You can see how much of jellyfish are uh, part of the bycatch of the fisheries. But in the Bottom slide over here, uh, what you see is the intake of this um, of the seawater to many of the desalination plants, the industries over there. And when we, they have jellyfish blooms, it causes uh, clogging of the intake. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, working with the government of Oman, uh, the fisheries and uh, department over there, we developed this system called DISCO, um, Decision and Information System for the Coastal Waters of Oman. And this is an operational forecasting uh, system, uh, which allows them to predict the onset of these blooms. And um, uh, one of the good things about the system, and this would be applicable to many countries that do not have the computational resources, this whole system works on a laptop. So, um, so it takes in satellite data, it takes in model outputs from a model that we have developed for this location, and it uses all this data, including crowd sourcing data and data from fishermen, and it brings all this data into a system that is uh, operated on a desktop called Easy, and it fuses this data and produces these products in near uh, real time, and it allows forecasts as well. And here, what you see on the right, uh, uh, on the left here below this schematic that I've shown is a real time forecasting system that is uh, where people can download images. And one of the important things about this model is that it accurately forecasts the, um, the oxygen loss in the water and when this oxygen poor waters will come to the surface. And so, now that we know that these plumes are driven by oxygen loss, uh, we can predict their onset in the Sea of Oman and along the Arabian Sea coast. 
So this system provides um, many other kinds of products that are used to the fishermen over there, the sea state five days in advance so they can plan their fishing activities. On the bottom over here, you see this fish kill that occurred. Uh, we use this tracer technology uh, that is in, embedded in our system that tells you that this fish kill that occurred was due to the loss of oxygen and the surfacing of this oxygen water that came into this region. So we are offering this system uh, to many, many um, stakeholders, and these include desalination plants that take in fresh seawater um, and whenever there's an algal bloom, it leads to clogging of their, their whole operations uh, to the oil industry and to aquaculture farms. Now, this is a very uh, useful system, and we have had requests from many countries in the region uh, requesting for their use, for its use for their own problems, um, which mostly stem from this uh, harmful algal bloom called Noctiluca. And uh, this system is now being used for uh, various other purposes like monitoring um, turtles and whales. And uh, um, it can be used for activities that are concerned with uh, the UN SDG goals 14. And can I have the next slide, please? And I think that was my last slide. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that presentation. So up next, we're going to hear a few water resources presentations from our developed teams. First, we'll hear from Wilson Good, a developed participant at our NCEI location in Asheville, North Carolina. Thanks, Sydney. Uh, my name is Wilson Good, and I'm representing the NC Cherokee Water Resources team. Our, product, our project used NASA Earth observations to address community concerns related to water quality and the health of watersheds by focusing on a foundational tree species in this environment, the hemlock. Next slide, please. Our project partner was the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians Natural Resources Department, responsible for the conservation and management of over 50,000 acres of Cherokee land in the southern Appalachian Mountains of Western North Carolina. Hemlocks, a crucial component of the environment producing numerous ecological services, have been facing widespread mortality in the southern Appalachian since about 2004. Not only does the hemlock provide habitat for animal species, for example, the endangered Carolina northern flying squirrel, but they also support healthy aquatic environments by stabilizing water temperatures and mitigating erosion. Because of their importance to aquatic environments, our study revolved around the watersheds that encompass the EBCI lands, especially the Oconolofty watershed. This project serves as an introduction and case study of some remote sensing methods for forest health monitoring and change detection that the EBCI could implement in their further use of remote sensing. Next slide, please. Our project used two primary methods. Uh, the first was an NDVI change analysis and the second was a suitability analysis. The team utilized Landsat 5 to create yearly winter NDVI images of the study area from 2000 to 2011. NDVI is the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which highlights the vegetation greenness of an area using surface reflectance in the red and near infrared bands. We compared average winter of 2003 and 2004 NDVI to average winter 2009-2010 NDVI in evergreen and mixed forest types to identify areas with the greatest NDVI decline, which could represent high hemlock mortality. The red, white, and blue image on the left emphasizes areas that exhibit a decline in NDVI over this time period in shades of red and areas that increased in NDVI in shades of blue. Known hemlock polygons within our study area were provided by the Hemlock Restoration Initiative and Great Smoky Mountains National Park. This information was used to identify topographical and environmental features most likely to support hemlock growth. These features included proximity to streams, forest type, slope, aspect, elevation, and summer and winter NDVI values. The importance of these features were weighted, leading to the creation of a map of locations most suitable for hemlocks within our study area. The map to the right shows the results of the suitability analysis in the Okunolofty watershed. Next slide, please. Almost two thirds of evergreen and mixed forest in the Okunolofty watershed exhibited a decrease in winter NDVI from 2003 to 2010. Much of this decline is along streams, which is likely hemlock mortality. Evergreens other than hemlock are experiencing their own declines due to various factors, including other adelgids, so we do not expect that all of the exhibited decline is due to hemlock. Additionally, some of the northernmost decline along the edge of the watershed might instead be biased by higher elevation snow cover, 
blocking the reflectance of evergreens in winter 2010. 28% of evergreen forests in the Yukon Lofty contained areas that were highly suitable to hemlock based on the weighted suitability analysis. Based on our analyses, between 4.5% and 9.5% of Yukon Lofty land was hemlock suitable in 2018. By demonstrating these analyses, we hope to provide guidance for EBCI that will support their future efforts in remote sensing. Next slide, please. As the partners of this project look towards expanding their own management practices, remote sensing provides an additional tool set, one that can help the partners build more autonomy in understanding and therefore managing their landscape and water resources. Next slide, please. The team would like to thank our partners at the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians for engaging with NASA Develop as they seek to expand the use of remote sensing in their land and water management, as well as our advisors in the Forest Service and the National Centers for Environmental Information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wilson. Up next, please welcome Jake Stid, a developed participant at Langley Research Center. Thank you, Sydney, and good morning and afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jake Stid, and I'll be representing the South Carolina Water Resources Group out of the Langley Research Center Develop Node, comprised of Elspeth Gates, Adriana Lecomte, Derek Wynn, and myself. And today we're going to talk about how our group helped to identify where to focus preservation efforts in the salt marshes of South Carolina, where sea level rise is only one of the many threats that these essential ecological areas are facing. Next slide, please. So salt marshes like those in South Carolina provide many services, including commercial fisheries, carbon sequestration, storm surge buffering, and flood mitigation. Both natural and anthropogenic phenomena, such as storm events, sea level rise, dredging, and urban development, threaten salt marsh sediment budgets, and thus the stability and long-term health of the marsh complexes. Specifically, over the last decade, the increasing occurrences of these phenomena have drastically affected sediment dynamics within the marshes. This poses a need to focus preservation efforts in marsh regions affected most by these events in order to ensure their survival. This product partnered with the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, the USGS, Woods Hole, Coastal and Marine Science Center, and the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control. Together, we collaborated to create a project that implemented a USGS methodology and incorporated on the ground knowledge from scientists and GIS specialists at the South Carolina DNR. Next slide, please. So the replicated methodology that we'll go through here involves finding the unvegetated and vegetated areas, the ratio of which is called the UVVR, the unvegetated to vegetated ratio. And this UVVR metric within specific marsh regions has been correlated in other study areas to sediment budget and lifespan of the marshes. This gives us a quantifiable metric for where to focus preservation efforts and roughly how long we have to do so before the marsh is lost entirely. So from left to right here, we have the aerial imagery in a digital elevation model feeding into a binary vegetation classification. That classified map was then aggregated, finding the UVVR over the watershed delineated marsh re regions to then extrapolate each region's lifespan. This map of marsh lifespan and the ability to create more maps in the form of a Google Earth Engine tool is what the partners needed to aid in their decision making regarding preservation efforts. However, a limitation with aerial imagery is that it's typically only recorded every two to three years. So this limits how much information regarding specific events you can gather from these maps. So to expand on the product for the partners, we wanted to see if we could use NASA Earth observations, specifically Landsat, to improve the temporal resolution of the maps and gather more event-specific information than what aerial imagery had previously allowed us to do. To accomplish this, we aggregated the classified vegetation map to Landsat resolution. This is the map you see in the upper right-hand corner of the products panel, and used a random forest regression to try and predict UVVR using only Landsat reflectance. Next slide, please. So here we have some results of this Landsat product. In plot A, a high resolution aerial image shown in natural color. This was the image that we classified as vegetation or not vegetation. In plot B, we have the Landsat resolution UVVR aggregation. In plot C, we have the random forest prediction of that UVVR aggregation. And in plot D, the probability of correctness of that prediction. So the result was a Landsat prediction with an R squared in relation to the observed value of 0.247 and a probability of correctness ranging from 0.2% to 65%. That low R squared value identifies the need for further research into more complex methods of classification and regression, as well as potential improvements in future space-based sensors. But also note that despite the low R squared values, many spatial features were preserved in the prediction, which is both interesting and useful in itself. 
I will also mention that we did create the maps that I spoke about before of the physically meaningful marsh regions and their respective lifespans calculated for 2009, 2015, and 2019. And what those maps showed is that in 14% of the study area, or roughly 17 square kilometers, marsh lifespan had decreased an average of 60 years over the last decade. Even more, 52 years of that lifespan decrease occurred over just the last four years. These regions with decreasing lifespans are where preservation efforts should be focused. Next slide, please. So those completed marsh region maps will be used by the DNR and the DHEC to focus preservation and restoration, restoration efforts on the 17 square kilometers of marsh with short or decreasing lifespans. In addition, the code that was used to replicate the methodology will enable the partners to easily deploy this tool along the entirety of the South Carolina coastline. The random forest relationship between Landsat and UVBR, when expanded upon in future research, will yield higher temporal resolution maps of marsh vulnerability. So with that, I would like to thank the South Carolina Water Resources team, our partners, and the developed support team. And I hope you enjoyed learning about how aerial and space-based imagery can be used to focus salt marsh preservation and restoration efforts. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jake. Up next, please welcome Paul Chen Wongchuk, a developed participant from our Goddard Space Flight Center location. Thanks, Sydney. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Palchen Wongchuk, and together with Tashi Choden, Kinlay Pem Dem, uh, Sonam Choden, and Chaozong Jigmi, we are the Southern Bhutan Ecological Forecasting Team. And this summer, we had the pleasure of working on modeling Asian elephant habitat suitability along the Southern Bhutan border with now using NASA Earth observations. Next slide, please. So uh, since 1986, the Asian elephant has been listed as endangered on the IUCN red list as their population has declined by at least 50% over the last three decades. The Asian elephant faces threats of extinction throughout its range, mainly due to human elephant conflicts. The elephant population is distributed throughout the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia. Asian elephants are a flagship species and are environmental engineers whose conservation is essential for the functioning of Bhutan's subtropical forest ecosystems. There has been an increase in incidence of human elephant conflicts due to recent clearing of forests, creating close proximity of human settlements to forested areas. This has led to retaliatory killing and injury of elephants and also results in farmers in southern Bhutan risking their annual harvest as well as their own lives. So we partnered with the Bhutan Foundation and the Bhutan Tiger Center to address this issue. We focused along the southern Bhutan border with specific interest around the Gelafu region, a fast developing town with an increasing number of human elephant conflicts in recent years. Uh, we also referenced data from 1999 to 19, uh, 2019 to cover a 20-year time span for the study period. Our objectives were to produce land use and land cover classification maps to serve as reference for historical land use trends for our study period. We also created an elephant habitat suitability model for 2019, which will help in identifying wildlife corridors. Next, please. <coughs> to train and run our habitat suitability model, we focused on collecting nine different variable data sets. The variables we decided upon were land cover classification, normalized difference vegetation index, or NDVI, annual average land surface temperature, population density, annual average precipitation, elevation, slope, distance to rivers, and distance to roads. Through communication with the partners and also through a literature review, these variables were selected because they are good indicators in studying Asian elephant habitats. Next, please. So now, um, as you can see here at the bottom of our screen, this is our land cover map for the year 2019 that has been clipped to our study area. So we created this through an unsupervised classification method in ArcGIS Pro, where, uh, which, we, which used training data and a machine learning algorithm to identify different land cover classes. We grouped these classes <clears throat> and we classified them into these five categories, or sorry, six categories, which were the most significant in the context of elephant habitat. To process and analyze our data, we used the software packages ArcGIS Pro and SOM, the software for assisted habitat modeling. We took the nine different variable data sets prepared in ArcGIS Pro and pre-processed it into SOM. We received elephant data from the partners and combined it with more samples from internet crowdsourcing to help increase the accuracy of our research. The data sets we received from the partners um, were collected via camera traps and radio collar, which were very useful in our research. 
SOM incorporated multiple habitat suitability models in computing our results, of which included the boosted regression tree and random forest models. The models took all of our training data and printed out maps that displayed the habitat suitability of Asian elephants throughout our study area. Next, please. So now uh, up here in the top right corner um, is a probability map from one of our four models in SOM, the boosted regression tree model. So the areas in blue represent the lowest probability of elephant occurrence and red represents the highest. And you can also see yellow and light blue up in the river valleys. Um, we can also see some color variation along the southern border of Bhutan, indicating high elephant occurrence in those areas. The SOM results suggest that elephants tend to occupy areas near roads and waterways and prefer warmer regions. Our suitability maps suggest where more camera traps can be installed to identify potential areas and expand understanding of Asian elephant habitats in Bhutan. The project yielded methods, maps, data products, and documentation that is being provided to uh, project partners for reducing human elephant conflicts and aiding wildlife management. A follow-on project is recommended to build upon the results, products, and cap uh, capabilities resulting from our initial study. We hope that our work will be used to build upon to improve decision-making capabilities of the Bhutan Tiger Center and help in future conservation efforts. And lastly, um, our team would like to thank the science advise our science advisors, our mentors, and our partners at the Bhutan Foundation and the Bhutan Tiger Center in making all of this uh, possible. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. And now for our final developed presentation of the day, please welcome Tashi Kaneko, a developed participant at Marshall Space Flight Center. Thank you, Sydney. Hi, my name is Tashi, and I'll be representing the Bhutan Water Resources Team at the Alabama Marshall Space Flight Center. And today I will be presenting the Bhutan Water Resources Project, where I will share my result, where I will share the results my team and I have obtained by comparing satellite model data and the ground station data for precipitation, temperature, and phenology to assist our partners in Bhutan. Next slide, please. The study region is the country of Bhutan, which is located in the Himalayas, where we focus on the three districts, namely Timpu, Chukka, and Gasa in Bhutan, which is located at the central, southern, and northern regions of Bhutan. In this project, we will primarily focus on the monsoon period of Bhutan, ranging from the years 1996 to 2017. The monsoon period in Bhutan is the, re is the season with the most rainfall, and it ties closely with the agriculture in Bhutan. The monsoon season mainly, mainly falls under the months of June, July, and August. Our project partners for the project are the Bhutan Foundation, the HEROES Project, also known as the Himalayan, Himalayan Environmental Rhythms Observation and Evaluation Systems, and the Ugin Wanchuk Institution for Conservation and Environmental Research. Moving into the communi community concerns, Bhutan experiences an increasing temperature warming. And this has resulted in several changes in its local climate, like the change in the annual total precipitation and the annual mean temperature over the past decade. Since Bhutan is an agricultural-based country and many communities are still actively involved in the field of farming, there are concerns with how climate trends could affect the agricultural sector. The, obje the objectives of the project, project were to analyze using Google Earth Engine platforms and data sets like CHIRPS, MODIS, and FLDAS four districts in interest. The data sets were then used to get a visual representation of the rate at which climate vari variables like precipitation, temperature, and phenology have been changing over the past years. Next slide, please. This flowchart explains how we use data from the ground and the satellite to investigate temperature, precipitation, and phenology. The institute data for the temperature and precipitation were acquired from Bhutan Bhutan National Hydrology and Meteorology, and the phenology data was acquired from the HEROES project, which is a citizen science collective. For the satellite data, precipitation, phenology, and temperature were acquired from CHIRPS, MODIS, and FLDAS using Google Earth Engine. Adjustments to the satellite model data had to be made to ensure that the data was at par with the ground data. This is because the ground data was acquired from a point location, whereas the satellite data is collected from a wider region. So the satellite data had, had to be filtered down to those regions of interest using elevation thresholds. Once the data was obtained, it was then plotted into an Excel sheet to obtain graphs. This, this is only an initial step for the project as 
This method can be repeated and used for further analysis within, within Bhutan and for our partners to use. Next slide, please. Here is, here is an example of one of our precipitation results. Based on the data collected from the Institute and the CHIRPS dataset for the past years, the Chuka district was the district with the highest amounts of rainfall among the three focus districts. When comparing the two data sets, we found that the Institute data was lower than the satellite model data. This is because the satellite data looks into a wider region as compared to a point location of the ground data. An interesting find is that both the trend lines for the rainfall has been increasing over the past years. A point to be noted is that the green area on the map represents the regions of interest, which is found using the elevation thresholds and the red dot represents the ground station. Next slide, please. In a nutshell, these visual representations and comparisons of data sets has helped us understand the changes that are taking place within Bhutan. This can help our partners and the people of Bhutan understand how climate variables like temperature and precipitation has changed over the past years. As per limitations, the model data had to be adjusted to account for elevation, which explains the variation in trends. There were also limited availability in institute data, making it difficult to match with the satellite data. It's highly possible that there are potential human errors while collecting data as well. For future work, it is crucial to place more emphasis on how these climate trends has impacted Bhutan's agricultural lifestyle and its implication for farmer, local farmers in the country. More research can be done to further examine the role precipitation and temperature have had on phenological trends and crop blooming. Lastly, I would like to thank DEVELOP and our partners and our project partners for giving us the opportunity and helping us develop our skills and understanding more about our country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tashi. Great job. To round out our water resources presentations today, please welcome Dr. Hyung Ki Lee from the University of Houston. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hyung Ki Lee from the uh, University of Houston. And today uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, status of my project in Lower Mekong. And I would like to first thank um, Brad and John for supporting this project and also Nancy and Sylvia team uh, for their support as well. Uh, I would like to also thank my PhD students, Chung Chang and Tian Du, and also uh, Dr. Dung Bui from Nawapi of Vietnam and also Sylvia Mekong. Uh, the picture on the, on the left that you see is the Tonisat Lake, uh, which is the largest uh, lake in Southeast Asia that I've taken last February uh, during the SAGE event. And the picture on the right shows the uh, floating village around the lake. And the man in the middle is showing the high water mark on the utility pole. So we can observe the dramatic difference uh, the local people experience uh, between the high and low water seasons. Next slide, please. So to give you a little bit of background, Mekong River is a transboundary river flowing through uh, six countries. And uh, it provides uh, important uh, uh, source of water uh, to the inhabitants. Um, even though the Mekong River Commission uh, provides river level monitoring and forecasting uh, for the people to its uh, member countries, but only at 22 hydrological stations at the main stem. And also uh, in practice, the data sharing can be uh, you know, uh, tricky in practice. So therefore, uh, we wanted to uh, answer these uh, two uh, questions. Uh, which is how can we transfer information from a gauge to ungaged catchments, in this case, from uh, Vietnam to outside Vietnam. And uh, we found that the physiography and climate-based uh, regionalized parameters can improve uh, prediction of stream flow at the ungaged catchments. And the second question is that how can we uh, evaluate model performance at uh, ungaged basins? And uh, we developed the altimeter uh, derived water level-based flow correlation method, which can uh, evaluate, evaluate model performance at the unengaged basins. So the answer to these questions are important to Vietnam because uh, half of 13 basins in Vietnam is transboundary and Vietnam is in downstream. So it's important to develop a method that the downstream countries can independently access the water resource information in the upstream parts. So um, uh, my PhD student, uh, Tian Du, has successfully developed um, a hydrological model uh, and set it up over the uh, Greater Mekong region. 
uh, based on the findings from these two uh, key questions. And the National Center for Water Resources Planning and Investigation, or NAWP in short of Vietnam, has adopted uh, the hype model and developing this uh, web application portal. Uh, next slide, please. So this ASEAN water portal uh, provides the historical uh, monthly and annual water balances, and also historical daily stream flow, uh, precipitation, evaporation, temperature, and so on. And we are currently working on uh, providing the short-term and uh, long-term uh, seasonal forecast of the stream flow. And also the climate change impacts on the water resources is going to be provided from the web portal soon. So we can ask this question, why do we need uh, such web portal? Well, uh, as a national agency, NAOP is mandated to uh, publish uh, newsletters about the forecast of the water resources. Um, but uh, the, their uh, current uh, forecasting capability is based on experiences or a real-time uh, meteorological data set, which can be often inaccurate. Um, and also um, the newsletters uh, the, that the other uh, sectors, such as uh, industry, agriculture, or transportation department use uh, can be um, misinterpreted due to the jargon used in the newsletters. And also the communications between non-water and non-water departments uh, can be also um, not uh, very um, um, fluent. So, um, so uh, we therefore expect this uh, web service can effectively uh, provide a um, uh, easy to understand information directly, uh, directly to the water users. Next slide, please. Now, yeah, now uh, let's talk about um, another application, which is flood. So Mekong River Basin is also uh, one of the most uh, flood prone regions in the world. And as a victim of Hurricane Harvey, I see that the uh, forecasting inundation extent is incredibly vital information while, I, while uh, watching my uh, cord got inundated. So the picture on the uh, top right uh, shows a touching moment of a lady playing uh, Amazing Grace with her flooded piano for the last time. So although Houston has this uh, operational uh, real-time inundation mapping system, uh, we don't have uh, inundation forecasting system. And even I, uh, the Institute gauge uh, at a reservoir has been blacked out for five days. Uh, which is located upstream of the Buffalo Bayou, which flows through the heart of the Houston. So not only the fourth largest city in U.S., but also Lower Mekong doesn't have such an inundation forecasting system. And the existing methods may not be appropriate or difficult to be applied over, more, uh, over Lower Mekong. So we wanted to develop a skillful but simple approach. Next slide, please. So we developed a new method uh, forecasting inundation extents using RUF, we named it as FEAR. And it uses the historical star images along with historical water levels or discharges. And from that, we can build a regression model. And then with the forecasted water levels or discharges, uh, we can generate the simulated forecasted uh, star images. So from those uh, forecasted star images, then we can develop uh, forecasted inundation extents. So overall, fear needs this uh, for, uh, water levels or discharges from an external source. And uh, coincidentally, fear means uh, mate or friend in Old English. So we have successfully applied this fear to the Tony Seb Lake. Can you play the uh, animation? Yeah, so uh, we applied the fear over this Tony Seb Lake floodplains and this animation shows the uh, daily cloud free a forecasted inundation extends over the region and we can clearly see its daily variation. Next slide, please. Now we want to uh, expand the study region to the entire Lower Mekong, uh, but the Lower Mekong, is, Lower Mekong Basin is a very complex uh, hydrologic system. So we have to consider not only the, uh, the 27 lake level variation, but also the variations over the uh, Mekong main stem and also the Mekong Delta. But fortunately, uh, we can forecast the 27 lake level from our previous study and forecast of uh, Mekong main stem from Mekong River Commission's operational river level forecasting system and obtain the forecast of uh, Mekong Delta water level 
from our previous study, which has been uh, supported by Severe. So um, we are working with currently with MRC since the MRC CEO expressed the needs of uh, the inundation forecasting system to complement their operational river level forecasting system. So we're going to be working with MRC uh, connected and supported by Servier Mekong. Next slide, please. Now I would like to think uh, even bigger. So the uh, top figure shows the output of the very first version of JSON2 altimeter tool uh, that I developed in 2013 for the flood forecasting system for Bangladesh, uh, led by my uh, colleague Faisal Hussein at University of Washington. Then later in 2017, we developed this automated version of uh, satellite, satellite altimetry toolkit, which has been later adopted by Severe to uh, develop that uh, web application. So it took about uh, seven years uh, from the very first version of uh, JSON altimetry tool to this uh, user-friendly one. So I would like to suggest that we think about and um, building the global inundation uh, forecasting system now. So we can, for example, like build a, um, such as flood super sites, similar to the geohazard super sites for a volcano uh, and earthquakes. So we can use, uh, for the global discharge data set, we can use uh, GeoGloss-Q developed by uh, Jim Nelson at Brigham Young University. And for uh, the processing of historical SAR images, we can use a cloud-based SAR data processing tool uh, developed by Franz Meyer at the uh, University of Alaska at Fairbanks. So it is expected that such global inundation monitoring and forecasting system uh, can mitigate the uh, uh, flood risk by predicting the spatial uh, flood hazard. Next, please. Uh, that's it, and thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, by email. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. We're now going to take a brief pause to complete one more poll for the week. So please take a moment and answer the poll, and we will resume shortly. All right, thank you so much. And now for our final presentation of the day and of the week, it is my pleasure to introduce Tim Mayer from NASA Servier. Thank you so much for joining us, Tim. Thanks so much, Sydney. Yes, uh, hello and thank you so much. Uh, I'm Tim Mayer, the Servier Regional uh, Science Coordination Lead for the Hindu Kush Himalaya Hub. Uh, I'm pleased to provide an overview and highlight of the Servier activities in Asia. Uh, next slide, please. So as discussed over the previous days here at the Applied Science Week, uh, SERVIR is a joint initiative between NASA and the U.S. Agency for International Development. We currently have activities in more than 50 countries. We collaborate with more than 250 institutions. And specifically, we have five hubs across the globe, with two in Africa, the first being in West Africa, located at Agramet, the next at Eastern and Southern Africa at RCMRD in Kenya, the newest hub, Amazonia, located in Cali, Colombia, at the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, or SEAT. And finally, the two hubs I'll discuss more, the Hindu Kush Himalaya Hub, or HKH, and the Mekong Hub. And all the folks that you've heard from over the past week from are from the Severe Science Coordination Office, located at the Marshall Space Flight Center. But we, all of us that you've heard from, all of us from Severe, are a vast network of individuals working to serve communities that comprise our regions. Next slide, please. So briefly, Servir focuses on four thematic areas across the entire project. The first being agriculture and food security, water and water related disasters, land use and ecosystem, and weather and climate. Next slide. 
Now, regarding the Severe HKH or Hindu Kush Himalaya Hub, the hub was established in 2010 and just signed a five year grant to continue efforts going forward. The host institution is the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, or ECMOD, located in Kathmandu. And the countries supported by Severe HKH are, are Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, and Myanmar. And here's a brief list of the ongoing services that HKH is providing to the region. And I'll discuss the regional land cover monitoring service in the preceding slides. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to the services that Servere HKH provides to the region, the hub is also working with the selected applied science team or ASTs for the hub to investigate the cutting edge techniques and methods to bring that information into and those approaches into the services themselves. So specifically, the hub is working with uh, Dr. Li Ping Di and team to incorporate the agroinformatic remote sensing products to complement the hub's current efforts to support food security decision making in the region. The hub is also working with AST Dr. Franz Meyer and team to leverage cloud-based SAR products to more effectively monitor the hydrologic cycle. The hub is also working with Dr. Peter Potapov and team to operationalize and improve the remote sensing products as part of the regional land cover monitoring system. And lastly, the hub is working with ASC Dr. Emily Brent and Dr. Aaron Nager on implementing advanced air quality monitoring and prediction products into the HKH region. Next slide. So now switching over to the Severe Mekong, this hub was established in 2014 and the host institution is the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center or ADPC, which is located in Bangkok, Thailand. And additionally, this hub is a consortium model, which has additional expertise and efforts provided by the Stockholm Environmental Institute or SEI, the Spatial Informatics Group, SIG, and Deltares. And the countries supported by Severe Mekong are Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, and the shared focus country with HKH of Myanmar. And again, here's a short snapshot of the ongoing services that Severe Mekong is providing to the region. I'll touch on the land cover monitoring system, as I mentioned before, as well as supporting Myanmar to respond to floods. And since I have a short amount of time to present today, I'll only highlight two of these services, but please look at the Severe service catalog as a complete collection of all the services across all of the various hubs. Uh, next slide. So just the same as HKH, Severe is working hand in hand with a new round of applied science team members. Um, first, the hub is working with ASD Dr. Robert Kennedy and team to integrate disturbance and vegetation mapping using cloud computing to more effectively monitor the lower Mekong. Continuing his efforts, AST Dr. Narendra Das and team are working with the hub to utilize the RIA system to provide crop forecasts, which is essential for ongoing food security services on the lower Mekong. Also, AST Dr. Dahlia Kirschbaum and team are working with the hub to provide remote sensing products to more effectively assess landslide hazards in the lower Mekong. And lastly, the hub is working with AST Dr. Yankee Lee and team, who we just had an opportunity to hear from, and specifically he's continuing his efforts to operationalize altimetry, SAR, and model data to meet the needs for more informed hydrologic mo monitoring in the lower Mekong. Uh, next slide. So with my remaining time, I wanted to highlight two services uh, for the severe HKH and the severe Mekong region. Uh, next slide. So the Hindu Kush Himalaya and the lower Mekong regions have experienced dramatic and rapid land cover change in recent years. For instance, in Myanmar, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, or FAO, from their forest resource assessments or FRA reports, show that uh, Myanmar's forest cover drastically declined from 58% in 1990 to 43% in 2015. To meet the need for effective land cover and especially forest monitoring, essential for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC, both Severe HKH and Mekong co-developed along with national forestry departments and government groups such as the Nepal Forest Research Training Center, the Afghanistan Ministry of Agriculture and Irrigation and Livestock, the Bangladesh Forestry Department, and the Myanmar Forestry Department, as well as hub parties, including the Spatial Informatics Group, SIG, the U.S. Forest Service, One Map Myanmar, and of course the expertise from the University of Maryland to create the regional land cover monitoring system. Next slide. So the RLCMS is a tool um, using cloud-based technology leveraging Google Earth Engine. This system uses historic Landsat series to produce wall-to-wall -wall land cover maps on a yearly basis from 1990 to present. 
And as mentioned by Andre and Emily in the previous days, the severe service planning approach involves needs assessments with, with stakeholders, service concepts, service co-development, and service delivery. So this is a cyclical process that utilizes the end user's feedback to, from each of these phases to reevaluate and improve the eventual end products of a given service. And you can see some of the photos from the Severe HKH and Severe Mekong representatives working with end users through these given phases. Uh, next slide. So the RLCMS system is flexible that, in that it incorporates end users objectives to construct national level topologies, which are necessary for reporting. So in addition to the exciting machine learning approaches used to produce the co-developed end products, the, the system also incorporates a robust field reference system, which I have highlighted in orange. Um, next slide, please. So as a tool to more effectively, efficiently, and systematically collect more field data, and or high resolution derived input samples essential for systems such as the RLCMS, the Collector Earth Online or CEO, an open source platform was created. And this platform, which is crucial for assessment and land cover product validation, was co-developed with the UNFAO, the Google Earth Engine team, the USGS Silver Carbon Program, and Servere, among many, many others as well. And quickly, you can see a demonstration of a sampling effort using CEO system to collect reference data based on an institution or an end user's need. Uh, next slide. So now regarding water and water related disasters. Uh, next slide, please. Monsoonal rains and tropical cyclones cause reoccurring floods in Myanmar, and there exists a direct need to monitor and disseminate information regarded inund regarding inundated areas in re near real time to allow emergency response operations and support relief activities by national and international organizations. To meet the need for rapid flood monitoring and map products, Severe Mekong, the Science Coordination Office, SIG, Deltaris, and SCI co-developed with OneMap Myanmar, the Myanmar Department of Disaster Management, DDM, or the My and the Myanmar Department of Hydrology and Meteorology, DHM, to create the hydrologic remote sensing analysis for floods or hydro flood system. Next slide. The hydro flood system, the hydro floods tool em employs the most recently available optical and active passive microwave remote sensing data from MODIS, VIRS, ATMS, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and Landsat to generate surface maps, surface water maps, enabling more timely and in-depth analysis and monitoring of flood events. And you can see a, a quick vis visualization of inundated areas derived from hydro flood system over the last year's monsoon season. Uh, next slide. So in addition to the hydro floods system producing remote sensing products, the Severe Science Coordination Office and Severe Mekong continue to work collaboratively to curate the front end of the system known as the Hydro Viewer. And our aim is that this platform will continue to be a useful tool for our end users to utilize, to be utilized to increase their preparedness and build capacity to further leverage EO for disaster response. Next slide. So I wanna say thank you so much for letting me touch briefly on the two exciting services that have been co-developed from Severe HKH and Severe Mekong. I wanted to take this opportunity to, to thank the entire Severe Science Coordination Office, the Severe Hubs, and the Applied Science team that have made all of these services possible. And as also, I wanna um, thank the dedicated team who organized the Applied Science Week and this entire event. So uh, please reach out to me as well as Amanda Markert, the Regional Science Coordination Lead for Severe Mekong, if you'd like to know more. Thanks. Thank you so much for your presentation, Tim. And thank you to all of our excellent presenters today and throughout the entire week. After a brief recess, please join our presenters in the breakout rooms starting at 2.15 p.m. Eastern time for further discussion. And again, you can find links to those breakout rooms on the event website or in the handout section here on GoToWebinar, and we'll post them at the end of the presentation today. On behalf of the Applied Sciences family, I'd like to thank you all again for attending our presentations this week and for engaging with our presenters. And for our final closing remarks, please welcome back Lawrence Friedel. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sydney. A fantastic job this week as our MC, um, sending out a nice applause to you. So again, thank you, Sydney, uh, and really thanks to all the speakers uh, and to the special guests. Uh, thanks to the attendees. Today we had over 200 
which puts us over a thousand for the week, um, which is just fantastic. Uh, over the week, we had 44 talks and, and all those different examples. Um, we covered the Western US, Central US, Eastern US. Um, we covered Americas, Asia, Africa. Um, we went global with partnerships uh, as well as the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we spanned from across the Earth Science Division, uh, where we had we heard from the head of the research program, the head of the data assistance program, as well as both the director and deputy director of the Earth Science Division. Um, in addition, we had the Mapathon as well as the breakout sessions, which I certainly hope you're going to join this last last bit um, in a little bit. So. So as I mentioned on Monday, um, nothing in earth science application makes sense except in the light of service and partnerships. Uh, and that was really on display all week long. Um, so on behalf of NASA, um, thanks to the partners, thanks to your collaboration, thanks to exploring the benefits with uh, the, the benefits of earth observations. Thank you working for the develop with the developed teams Thank you work for working with all of our, our science application teams. Uh, and thank you for your trust in us in taking a risk uh, to use Earth observations or to see where it had value. Uh, we really, really appreciate your partnership. We really appreciate your collaboration. Um, and also a huge shout out to all of the developers. Um, these 15 projects that we heard about this week um, are were fantastic. Um, we're excited about what they've done we're excited about your future uh and and um and really just congratulations um thanks for joining the develop program uh for this summer term and for those of you who have been more than one term thank you for coming back um good luck in all your future endeavors um we certainly hope you'll consider becoming a develop fellow um and uh and please tell your friends and, and your colleagues and all about um about develop as an opportunity to all of the friends and parents and siblings of the developers who may be online, um, you can be really proud of, of what they've done. Um, they really, really rocked it. Um, and with this slide, another group that really rocked it was the planning committee. Uh, this team just did just did fantastic things over the last, uh, the last several weeks and last several months. Um, there's lots of people to thank. Um, obviously, a lot of them are right there on the screen. Um, I really encourage them actually to turn on their cameras um, so that people can take a look. Um, and I hope everyone can give them a thanks in, in some way. Um, and they're why you knew about Applied Sciences Week. Uh, and that's also why it has gone so well. So our huge, our huge appreciation. Um, so let me just sort of say some of the things about them. Um, let's see, they have been incredibly dedicated Absolutely. Organized, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Creative, um, for sure. And reliable, 110, maybe even more, 110%. So it has been a fabulous team to work with. They have kept me, they have kept leadership inform, informed, but they really did things by themselves, by themselves. Um, that was probably so I wouldn't mess things up, like ask them to change fonts or something like that. Um, but really, they just did a fantastic job and just worked so independently. So a huge thanks, a thanks to them. So I know we're we're giving shout outs to you all and we're all giving muted applause to you all. So thank you very much. Um, and while it's all gone really well, we certainly hope that next year we're not doing this virtually. <laughs> Maybe we do some combination next year of in person uh, with a virtual attendance and all. Um, and but it has really gone well. Um, but again, we hope you and yours are staying safe um, and uh, and all. And so as we close out, a quick reminder, as you can see on the screen about the about the breakouts. So we're going to wrap up the plenary sessions for the 2020 Applied Sciences Week, uh, and we look forward to seeing you all in the breakout sessions. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>